Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Changing the Climate, a show where we talk about the changing world around us and how we can make it better. Brought to you by Climate Change Realty. All right, hello, hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode, and I am, of course, very lucky, honored, and excited to welcome my guest, Jesse Noller. Hi. <laughs> Uh, howdy, everyone. It's uh, actually a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to have you, man. And of course, we always love to get the show started with a teeny bit of background on who you are and how you got to be doing what you're doing at the moment. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So my name is Jesse Noller. Um, I'm 41 now, so I'm actually a lot older than people think. Um, and my particular uh, thing that I do now is I run a mycology supply and mushroom farm in Lafayette, Colorado, uh, called the humble fungus. And, um, before that, uh, I actually did, uh, computer engineering and distributed systems design. So, um, back in the day when the cloud was created, I was there, unfortunately building the better bombs and guns for all the capitalists. So, uh, <laughs> So yeah, no, um, my background is actually in discrete engineering and things. And so none of my background is in like chemistry or biology or anything else like that. So this has been a complete life pivot. And um, we do everything here at the Humble Fungus. We do, uh, we do our own genetics, forest rebuilding. We're working on plastic remediation. Really, we do everything up to selling fresh mushrooms at the market. Um, and it's just because of the flexibility of fungi and fast forward, you know, after a career of tech, it's like, it's really given me a good, it's given me a good mental model for how to scale, not just a business, but also certain aspects around climate change and forest remediation, right? It's, uh, because I can, because all of us here think in terms of like, systems and ecosystems and you know action and reaction some of the things that we're doing it's like we have the agaricon mushroom which is known as if i remember correctly the god mushroom well, paul stamets talks about it all the time we have it growing in our lab right we actually have it growing on spawn we're trying fruiting blocks and things like that and the reason why is that this mushroom contains um hundreds of thousands of beneficial compounds um and it's an endangered species um, with the humble fungus, like we started, like we call it sport to table and it's because we do everything. Like we go out, we find wild mushrooms, we clone them and we try to conserve them. And so we've got a large genetic library of wild ones that over time as the business, you know, hopefully flourishes, um, we're going to be reaching out more and more in terms of trying to teach people how fungi can really be teamed up with to help solve a lot of the problems. And it, honestly, some of the existential crises that humankind is kind of like realizing that we've kind of like lobbed onto ourselves. So For sure, that's me. That's my background. Um, I've lived all over the place. I've lived in Alaska, Colorado. Where Boston. are you from? uh nowhere really uh, i was a military brat military Sweet. kid so i spent most of my childhood up in alaska though so uh yeah you city folk all confuse me yeah well we're a confusing bunch are we i mean i'm born <laughs> in manhattan raised in like suburbs of new jersey so i, I would call oh. myself a, a bit of a hybrid in that sense but um yeah man, great great to have you and we're gonna dive into the world of mushrooms i'm really excited or oh, yeah. mycelium or, or is, is the overarching term would just be fungi right yeah so it's kingdom fungi right it's yeah. kingdom fungi it's uh every so often we rummage around we add like fifteen thousand species to it just for funsies um but yeah, it's, it's really kingdom fungi and we talk a lot about like the mycelial web and how it's all interconnected and interrelated and you can view kingdom fungi much the same way, right? It's um, nothing exists in kingdom fungi that doesn't have a purpose, right? It, everything has a purpose, but it's all interrelated. Like you can try to grow certain species, like say beefsteak or chicken of the wild, domestically like in a lab but if you don't go out to the wider uh kingdom fungi and look at the things that are closest to it in the tree 
and the bacteria, you won't be able to grow it, right? And so we think about this in terms of kingdom fungi and just like this deep mycelial web connecting all of us as humans and trees and everything else like that because fungi are everywhere. They're in our hair, our cells, like the same thing that kill them, kill us, right? 100%. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to like start from the beginning with the whole fungi thing. Cause I'm, I'm assuming most people don't know anything about it, but right before we do that, I just want to talk about like how this like pivot occurred from you, like working in tech to all of a sudden starting your own like fungi company. Like what's the backstory behind that? So it's considered a rabbit hole. So my particular background, um, just to be full disclosure, because I believe in transparency, I, um, I grew up with pretty majorly severe, like really, really off the charts ADHD. Um, And it was untreated until I was like 39. Um, And couple that with depression and anxiety, it kind of leaves you, one of the traits of ADHD, especially as a kid, is you end up kind of learning how to process the world around you to kind of figure things out, right? Because not a lot of things make sense and it's all kind of chaotic. And so you spend a lot of your time kind of facing chaos and sorting through the stuff and fast forward to like getting everything treated. Um, I hit a point where all of a sudden, like my brain kind of like slid into, it's like the lock, the locks all kind of align. Um, and what I realized, and this was like two, two and a half years ago, almost three now, what I realized is like my life in tech, um, really serve like one sole purpose. And that was money, right? Mm -hmm. It was my entire soul and identity as an American white child, white male child was, I am to provide money for a family unit to go and do these things. Right. Well, to go and do what things to go. So Uh, they can go do the same thing again. Yeah. It basically is. It's like, I am here to provide for them. And that's my job, right? It, my job is to provide money for them ad nauseum, right? Um, I am I am the supplier, I'm the hunter, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fast forward, a divorce, you know, getting married, having kids. I've got two girls, Abby and AJ. Um, and actually my oldest broke her back on Sunday at a horse competition. She's okay. Oh, Jesus. She's going to recover just fine, but ooh, that's fine. Sorry to hear but, that. But fast forward through all of the divorce and everything, and I'm sitting there with, you know, a very good, healthy career in tech, having done open source. And I've worked for large companies, Macromedia, Adobe, Microsoft, Rackspace, like you name it, I've, I've done the circuit. Um, what I found myself left with was a lot of friends and deep connections on the internet but no one I could hug. Oh man. And I know that's, I know that sounds dark. I wish I was here in person to give you a hug right now. And so it's like, what I realized, you know, getting everything treated was my alignment, given my history growing up in Alaska and everything, my mental alignment is all about science, like provable things like uh, distributed systems, like the cloud. um, They operate on the same type of natural um, order that fungi and ecosystems operate on, which is they're independent, right? They all have independent behaviors, but they're working together inside of a, in concert to paint this much more complex tapestry, right? And so Facebook, if you start walking backwards, um, all of a sudden it's hundreds of thousands of machines pushing hundreds of billions of gigabytes of information, right? But each one of those things, like if you were to take a forest and the network of that forest and overlay it on top of a computer system, you'd see almost the exact same like uh, network, right? You'd see the exact same network relationship of nodes and interconnectivity, et cetera. And so here I am with this career in tech that's given me this ability to think in extremely large scale, discrete terms. And I've always had a passion for science. And so all of a sudden I said, I need connection and I need to start filling a void in my life, like living. 
So I started growing plants. I started growing vegetables. I started growing tomatoes. I started growing cannabis because it's legal in Colorado. Fuck um, yeah. r- realized I'm not good at any of that because I don't have patience <laughs> for plants. Okay. Um, but going through that, it's I started digging more and more into the science, right? It's all of a sudden I got the book, right? I started looking at soil science, soil horizon, soil chemistry. I started working out in the garden. I actually moved to a house that's like half the house I wanted, but it's got a massive yard with like four raised garden beds. I'm like, here we go. Um, so what when I was that? What doing, year? What year was that? Um, uh, about a year and a half ago. Cool. Yeah. So um, a couple months right before COVID, I moved into this house and I basically, I had already been growing. What ended up happening was a kind of a culmination of events. I got my ADHD treated and I started volunteering again at a food bank. It's a community food bank in Louisville. Yeah. And so I was volunteering there and then COVID started to happen. And what I saw was I was actually having tendonitis issues. I I shattered my wrist a couple of years ago, skateboarding with my kid. It's like, I started having more and more problems actually doing physical labor and then COVID hit and all of those restrictions like hurt a lot of like the food distribution stuff. And so around about December, January, I had already gotten with the leadership of community food bank. And I said, Hey, I hear hear you have this garden program. I'm a techie. I have too much money and time on my hands. How about I start in my house? So this is before I had moved to having an outdoor bed. I basically mm-hmm. converted my daughter's bedrooms because they spend most of their school year over at my ex's. Mm-hmm. And um, I converted their bedrooms to basically greenhouses. And so I started growing food crops for community food share. And very quickly, I, I started digging down into the soil science and realizing that a lot of the problems I was having were around like, too much moisture, too little moisture, right? The basics. Then I started, you know, going back to soil acidity, then bacterial life. And it's funny because a lot of people who grow mushrooms start with mushrooms and they kind of work backwards. They fall backwards into other plants. I did the exact opposite, right? I already have a good solid background in science and chemistry, et cetera. I was like, I want to grow the best tomatoes and cannabis and vegetables that I can because I'm going to give, you know, everything but the cannabis to the food bank. So I ended up growing like seven or eight hundred pounds of vegetables that summer, that spring, that summer in the garden. And working on all of that, it's I started digging more and more into mycorrhizal life. So mycorrhizae are fungi. They don't fruit, right? They don't produce mushrooms. Mm hmm. But mycorrhizae are the only reason your garden and the forest work, right? So plants, um, green plants, like our, our, um, our trees and things like that, those leaving plants that we know to produce oxygen, literally wouldn't be able to function without mycorrhizal fungi, right? So trees, roots, and plant roots, they start out super duper thick and then they get thin, right? However, trees don't naturally create those thin capillary roots into the soil. What they need is a mycorrhizal fungi to come along and actually knock on their cell walls and say, hey, buddy, I'm cool. Let me in and I will give you CO2 Mm -hmm. that you need to produce oxygen. And I'll also give you the nitrogen, phosphorus and other molecules that you need. So this mycorrhizal fungi, all of a sudden, once I learned about that growing uh, plants and gardening, all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, I need to go get a bunch of mycorrhizae. And I fell down the rabbit hole, right? Well, what does that I'm, mean, mycorrhizae? Mycorrhizae is basically, um, oh God, I actually forgot the actual definition. But um, what it is, it's a fungus. So let me back I'll, up. Yeah. And what fungal is a biology. fungus? Oh, yeah. Fungal what is biology. a fungus so, and how, and what's so, an animal and what's a plant, you know, like, yeah, I think so that's what we let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's come to that. It's like, but the rabbit hole that I fell down is one of chemistry science and forestry, right? It was all of a sudden I started bringing these fungi in my garden and I was growing tomato plants taller than I am. And I'm mm-hmm. six foot one. I have honest to God, I have never seen a garden go and a yard goes crazy. And I'm just running around, just like throwing like mushroom spawn and everything else, like all over the place, like Johnny Appleseed, 
<laughs> and I'm, I'm going out to the forest and I'm just like harvesting oyster mushrooms and chucking them into my compost. And I had morels growing in my front garden bed and I just went berserk, right? What I found for my particular brain is like plants grow way too slow. Fungi grow fast. Fungi want to grow. Like given enough food, they will grow infinitely, right? That's why we have 200 plus acre sized fungi floating around in the wild. Um, yeah. And so it's like, what I figured out is like, they want to grow and what's more, and we can go into this, like with the biology thing, it's, mm -hmm. um, they're basically little molecular computers, right? They're just little bits of code that are very, like each spore contains all of the genetic memory for every shape of every molecule they've ever consumed, right? And so if you think about that, all of a sudden I'm like, oh shit. This is code. I can hack code, right? Oh so now God. all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, I got addicted. I'm like, okay, so wait. If I can create a nitrogen molecule that looks like X, then the mushroom's just going to eat it, right? And it, it's it's mind blowing once you get into it because all of a sudden you're realizing that it's like kingdom fungi is just so much wider, deeper, and it is so yeah. utterly tied to the existence of organic life on our planet. Absolutely. That um, I am terrified of things like mass produced fungicides and things like that because I'm like, wait a minute, y'all. Like, we're talking about screwing up like our cell bonds, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we will break our DNA. Um, but yeah, so I, that was the rabbit hole I've fallen down. And it's like all of a sudden I realized that from a single like set of mushroom spores, Mm -hmm. or a single mushroom for, from a local grocery store. So just to put this in the context, I can go to the local grocery store and I can find an oyster mushroom. Yep. I can cut that oyster mushroom in half, walk away with only half. I can bring that to my lab. I can cut a one centimeter by one centimeter cell sample, right? Less than the size of my pinky nail, right? And... um. I can recreate the entire genetic line from that. Right. Can't do that I with can people. Take, I can take a centimeter by centimeter piece of mushroom flesh and I can repopulate the planet with that. Right. And so that's why our conservation work is kind of easy, but also kind of hard at the same time. It's like, you got to go find them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really mind blowing just how deep and how far it's like, you realize that fungi can eat hydrocarbons so they can eat plastics and polymers and things like that. And it's like, we're going to get into it all of a sudden. Yeah. All of a sudden fast forward now, it's like my biggest problem is an owner of a company. It's like, what do I not do? Right. Yeah. Uh, I feel that. So, man. <laughs> at, so we've all agreed as a team, like our goal here is to grow a bunch of mushrooms and really make growing mushrooms and kingdom fungi accessible to everyone no more magic no more mystery it's mm -hmm. science it's observable science and what's more anyone can do it you don't need specialized equipment although it's lovely to have mm -hmm. um so yeah now it's hell yeah man na now it's now we're at farmers markets we're at longmont and boulder farmers markets boulder over wednesday and longmont every saturday um we're selling fresh mushrooms we're moving into tinctures we're selling mushroom grain, sterilized stuff. We process over a ton of sterilized grain a week with three of us, mm -hmm. right? And that's where the engineering background came really handy. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's it's really amazing. And just just I, I just want to encourage everyone, you and everyone listening that watch out. Like this is, this is amazing stuff. Like I it can't is. tell you how utterly life-changing for me and my soul, it's been to kind of go and realize that we have something so hackable and flexible and powerful at the tips of our fingers. And it's just sitting there and it, yeah. you can't patent it. You can't copyright it. It's, it's there. It's at the, well, it's, flo the it's floating. We're breathing it into our noses yes. right now. Right. And, so, and, yeah. Let's talk about bio. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't think many people understand like what 
like a mushroom actually is and how it compares to like a plant or an animal. But be- right before that, I just want to say your story is amazing. And it's like, seems like you're born to be doing what you're doing right now. And I'm so glad you got out of like the shadows of the tech world and like use it, but you're still, it was obviously, it's obvious to me that you, this was the path you were meant to walk because you're using these skills now, which we're going to get into all your ideas about how you're going to make the world better through, through what you're doing now. But uh, I just, that was it's just amazing, man. Yeah. I'm just happy to, happy to have you right now. You. So, so the way I understand it is like, there are like, there's different kingdoms of like living things, right? There's like the, the mini, like the microorganisms and there's like multicellular organisms. And then there's like plants, animals, and fungi that's like the five kingdom model right Mm -hmm. so we are obviously mostly concerned with like animals like we're the ones who are like changing the climate and like eating up all the resources and then we eat and then plants you know give us oxygen and we work together with plants but what are fungi how do they work and how are they so deeply connected to our lives as plants and animals so let me be the first to tell you I'm about to ruin your education. Um, and so I love any, it. anybody over the age of 20, actually 10 right now, um, is in for a rude shock. <laughs> uh, so the five kingdom model has basically gone the way of the dodo. Yeah. Um, what, we, what we realized is humans are really bad at characterizing things. Um, and so we've actually had to re uh, jigger and rejuggle all of the kingdoms. Um, and part of that is we've got things like protists and other single celled organisms. So uh, a good example is a slime mold. A slime mold used to be a fungus. It used to be in kingdom fungi because we looked at it and it's like, okay, it's multicellular and unicellular, but okay. So it can, it does cellular division. That's cool. Um, so we're going to put it in kingdom fungi. And then what we realized is that they have much more flexibility in terms of controlling their own cells, nuclei, et cetera. And so we actually had to move them to, king, uh, to the protists, right? So what you've got to think about is king, each one of the kingdoms, um, if, uh, let me remember, is um, humans and animals are in uh, eukaryotes. Uh, I think that's correct. Um, And what that means is like, we have cellular division, we are multicellular. um, And it's also a lot about how we replicate, right? How we eat and how we replicate. And so um, rewind a billion years or back to the start of organic life on the planet, right? So we're sitting there and we've got this primordial pool And really before this moment in time, organic life, organics didn't exist. So think about after the Big Bang, the only thing that existed in our universe was chemistry, like hardcore, like here's rock and here is, you know, uranium, like we're going to mix that with some gypsum and we're going to get jazz, right? And so in this primordial pool, all of a sudden we get the spark of carbon carbon life, like organic life. Um, Fungi were some of the first ones to kind of crawl out of that primordial pool, right? So Mm -hmm. in that pool, we started single cell, then we, uh, then everybody started evolving uh, multicellular replication. Um, Then they started crawling out of the muck. Um, The oxygen levels in the atmosphere started to increase. Oxygen is the, one of the only reasons we have organic life, right? Um, So fungi, are they crawl out of the pool and at the very dawn of time like there used to be mushrooms like the size of dinosaurs the taller like vast buildings like they were the original in the ocean no on the rock right so think about this like fungi started in the water like the same primordial pool that we are they evolved to go on to land and then the only reason we have soil is because fungi started eating rock Right. So there are fungi and lichen and everything around us that are just decaying the rock everywhere. Right. Without that action, we would not have soil on the planet. Right. So these giant tree, these giant building size fungi are just basically living off the mineral, like that chemical, that chemistry. Right. Um, and so, right. You know, fast forward, you know, a few million years, 
this will blow your mind. Fungi, right? They're not in kingdom. They're not in our kingdom. They're not plants. Because at the very, like, after we get out of that primordial pool, we got kingdom fungi, and then animals branched off of kingdom fungi. Right? So you had what? kingdom fungi. Yeah, we had these we single cell, multi cell fungi, etc. And then all of a sudden, boom, instead of plants, multicellular animals jumped out of kingdom fungi. And then, like, I think it's 10,000 years later, 10,000 years later or more, plants diverge from kingdom fungi. Uh -huh. <clears throat> right? It's like that's this is Christopher Nolan sound, right? Ver verifiable information people yep. can look it up. Yep. It's 100%. It's like what we've realized is that evolutionarily, we share more RNA with fungi than we do with plants because we uh -huh. branch we branched from that tree earlier than plants right that's why plants can generate lignin and all this other like crazy stuff and we're mm -hmm. still like sloshing bags with mostly salt and water um and so it's mind-blowing and that's why i said earlier it's like because we branched off so early from them it's like the same fungicides that kill fungi kill us, right? Mm -hmm. The same, the same things that harm us harm them. So climate change, extreme cold, extreme sure. heat, et cetera, they hurt us. They're going to hurt them. Um, cosmic rays, things like that. It's like, again, we're in the same boat. Kingdom fungi and us, like if we die, they die. If they die, we're dead. What do they consume to like reproduce? So, so kingdom fungi, it's like, obviously there's a whole bunch of different eating methods. So, um, if, if I walk down from the top, you've got kingdom fungi and you've got two spork, uh, zygomycota and di uh, dicaria and dicaria are really the mushrooms we want to talk about because those actually include the cydia mycota, which are mushrooms. This is known as club fungi, which every time I hear like the city of Mycota includes mushrooms, like mm -hmm. what we think of in terms of like, when you go to the store and you get a mushroom or you're walking in the woods, mushroom, usually they're going to be best city of Mycota. There's another one, Asco Mycota, that includes morels and other things. And we can get to the differences later, mm -hmm. but focusing on these allows me to actually explain the digestive process, right? Uh, so fungi... Um, the best way to describe it is think of the game memory, right? So, uh, child's like game memory. Is that like a board yeah. game? What is that? Yeah, no, it's the child's game memory. You take all the cards out and they've got like, there's a match for each one, right? Mm -hmm. And so okay. you lay all the cards face down and you flip one over and if it doesn't, and you flip a second one over, if they don't match, you flip them back over and you have to remember okay. where they were placed. Sure. So the reason why I'm saying this is that going back, a mushroom spore or a fungus spore is contains like the memory of everything it's eaten, but it does that through basically molecular matching, right? So fungi use an external stomach, right? So they actually, for lack of a better term, they throw up all over their environment their environment is dissolved via enzyme and amino acid reactions, so chemically. And what happens is the food that they want actually isn't like dung or grass or mm -hmm. dirt. What they're looking for is the carbon molecule or the nitrogen molecule or the oxygen molecule. And what they're doing is they're saying, hey, 10,000 years ago, I figured out how to eat lignin which is what trees make right it's what make trees what strong. is it's what a, is lignin lignin is um the um so trees the reason why trees are so strong is because they contain lignin lignin is a type of cell that is actually completely chaotic right there's no rhyme or reason to it which allows trees to be super strong and grow super uh super tall and like make good strong building materials Fungi are the only thing can eat, that can eat lignin, right? 
So 10,000 years ago, that fungus realized that it could break down lignin to its core carbon and nitrogen, you know, sugars, uh, sugars and just base carbon. Um, and so what happens is that when those spores germinate, like they make hyphae and mycelium, right? And so the fungus itself is actually this white mass of threads that are interwoven. It's not the mushroom that you see. And so that fungus sits under the ground and all around it are things like dead leaves, dead trees and things like that. And that fungus actually excretes these enzymes that actually breaks that matter down to its base molecular form, mm -hmm. right? And then it absorbs, like, this is the crazy thing, right? So um, fungi just like, they just absorb those molecules. They're just like, okay, I want molecule A, B, and C. I'm mm -hmm. going to take those. I don't want molecules X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to take those, but I'm going to pass those to the life around me. In other words, if a tree needs uh, CO2 and nitrogen mm -hmm. and the fungus doesn't need that, the fungus will actually just be like, hey, buddy, take these. Right. And so uh, the way fungi eat is by molecular matching. It's like, hey, if you can give me carbon, oxygen, CO2, and nitrogen, or basically sugars, you can have then the rest. I will grow. Yep. Um, and basically, that's the, that's the building blocks of all organic life. Um, and so and do so, different fungi eat like different elements? That's a great question. Yes. And so um, a good example is white rot fungi. So what, what white rot fungi is just another term for things like oyster mushrooms. So mm -hmm. if you go to the store and you buy oyster mushrooms, um, those are usually uh, Pluteris ostriatus, um, pearl oyster mushrooms, or some hybrid or mutant of that. Um, and if you go out to the woods and you look at a stump or something like that, and you see those big, beautiful gilled mushrooms, usually those are nine times out of 10, they're going to be a type of oyster mushroom. Um, those white rock fungi, um, those, those guys consume, they're known as primary decomposers. In other words, in a forest, everything is broken down to primary decomposers and secondary decomposers as part of the carbon cycle of the forest, right? So um, trees obviously exhale oxygen, but they sequester or take in carbon. Um, and so these primary decomposers, right? A fungi goes in and it makes a relationship with a tree. Right. And it doesn't want to kill the tree because everyone's like it's symbiotic, right? Everyone's benefiting from this. Right? It's a mutualistic relationship. Um, everyone's benefiting. Um, but the tree is going to die. Sooner or later, trees die. At that point, a white rot fungi, a primary decomposer, kicks into gear. Right. These primary decomposers understand how to turn that tree flesh into smaller and smaller molecules. So this white rot fungi is going to primarily consume the lignin, the hard stuff, and then some of the cellulose and sugars. And then there's going to be this remainder, right, of carbon and nitrogen that that white rot fungi didn't want. Then come in the secondary fungi, like the secondary decomposers. You know, you've got beefsteak, uh, cubensis, uh, psilocybin cubensis species are actually uh, secondary decomposers. Um, there are, that's what we see uh, on like poop. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually because that is a partially composted poop matter. Like mm -hmm. poop is partially composted matter. And so mushrooms will naturally attract to that. Fungi will naturally attract to that. So anywhere you go that you see these mushrooms, um, if it's a great big chunky tree and you see mushrooms coming out of that, that's going to be a primary decomposer that will kick in after that tree dies, like it's usually symbiotic or mutualistic. There are aggressive fungi that will go in and actually kill trees and other plants to eat them. Mm -hmm. um, but usually those are also primary decomposers, right? They're the ones that can actually eat those giant chunky molecules that are hard to break down. Your secondary decomposers wait for the mass from those guys coming down 
And then they break down that mass even more. So if you ate like 60% of the mass from the tree, that last 40% is going to be broken down by um, your beef steaks, your wine caps, um, and your other types of fungi that thrive on partially decomposed matter. And so each one has a special place, but they're all aligned to one thing, which is breaking down all organic life to the smallest molecule possible. So if mushrooms break down de like deceased organic life, then how do mushrooms like die they, by just not having things to feed off of? And do, do they actually die or do they just decrease in like mass? So let's go back to the fungus, right? So if you, if you think about a mushroom, right, on the forest floor, if you look at that mushroom, that mushroom is actually the, for lack of a better term, the sex organ of a fungus, right? Yeah. So a mushroom is just a method for spreading their spores, right? Mm -hmm. Never call them mushroom seed, seeds. Everyone will laugh at you. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, a mushroom is only there to spread the mushroom seeds. And so when you see mushrooms go away or come and go away, usually it's just like the fungus saying either conditions were right and I did my job and I spread my spores or conditions aren't good because fungi are intelligent, right? And that's the other thing. Like that's the other mic drop I'm going to do, right? There's a few of them. Fungi respond to stimuli, right? And so they're smart enough and intelligent enough to say, hey, wait a minute, oxygen levels have decreased. So I am going to stop making mushrooms. It is not optimal or it's a drought. I'm going to stop growing. Mm -hmm. And so underneath the forest floor, you know, attached to that mushroom is this big white mass, right? It's a big, think of it like a great big basketball of interwoven hyphae and threads, right? It's a great big solid mass. That's the fungus. And so a fungus will sit there underneath the soil and it will fruit for decades. Those things like a fungus living under the forest floor can last hundreds of millions of years. We know that the honey mushroom, there's a honey mushroom called the humongous fungus up in Oregon. It lives up on a plateau. Right. So think about a plateau for a big round thing. Um, it's a giant petri dish. Right. So this giant honey mushroom, this honey fungus, has encompassed this entire plateau. It's like 200 uh, plus acres. Um, and this fungus is just underneath the soil growing everywhere. And it's because it has unlimited food. Right. So there are literally mycelial mats as large as tonic plates under our feet, right? And some of these mushrooms will push out or some of these fungi will make mushrooms, others won't. And so to They're your just question, chilling. yeah, to your question, fungi are smart enough, like uh, uh, morels. So uh, there are uh, family morcello, which is what morels are in, are actually ascomycota. They're not white rock fungi. Um, but they have some, some of their varieties are a little persnickety. Like they're a little, they don't like to group unless the very specific conditions are met. So imagine you're this yellow burn morel, right? So your spores land, they germinate and they grow. Well, obviously you want to breed. Well, in the yellow morels case, it's going to be like, eh, what'll happen is it'll go and it'll colonize around the trees of this forest. It'll go into the soil. And it develops this thing called a scleria and this hard outer shell. And then it goes dormant. Basically, it grows to a point that it's happy with. And it just kind of pauses. Mm -hmm. And it waits for a fire. Right? And so they're smart enough to wait for the perfect conditions. Right? So a forest fire comes. And all of a sudden, all this free carbon just happens to like hit the ground. Yep. What that does is it changes the soil's acidity and it adds a whole bunch of nutrients and chemicals that the morels didn't have access to. But more importantly, the morels now know that fungus, the morel fungus now knows that there's no competition in the area. Right. And so they wait. And so they'll wait until there's no other competition in the area. 
so they can spread their spores and have the maximum chance of taking over the most nutrients, mm. right? So fungi, mushrooms come and go. Like they've been worshipped throughout hundreds of thousands of years no doubt. as magic, right? It's like they appear overnight, they vanish like within hours. Really, that's all about the fungus underneath us, right? That's the fungus kind of saying, I like this place and I'm going to make a mushroom because I think I can have babies. Um, mm -hmm. And so our job as a mushroom grower, like as an urban mushroom farm, we grow everything indoors. And so 99.9% yeah. .9 of my time, I'm fighting nature, right? I am actually trying to recreate synthetic forest environments inside of little plastic bags and jars. Um, huh. A little sketchy. Um, <laughs> but, but once you understand the triggers, right? Again, let's back up to the fact that they're little computer, little bits of computer code that understand all of these molecules and how to eat them. What that means is that me as a mushroom grower, if I know that a morel wants a fire, I can re-engineer that. I can say a fire is a couple of things. It changes the acidity of the soil. It adds a bunch of free carbon. So in mushroom terms, that would be a casing layer. So think of just like the forest floor, like that top layer of like dead leaves and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a casing layer. So I'm going to make one of those and I'm going to make sure it would change the acidity. So I'm going to set the pH. Um, and then fire is hot and then cold. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw it in the freezer or the refrigerator, cold shock it. And then I'm going to put it in something warm. And what that allows me as the engineer, as the grower, as the scientist, is I can completely fake out the fungus, right? The fungus is just like my conditions are met, like mm -hmm. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G are all done. I will now fruit. Okay. So, and so to your question, it's all about what what is the stimulus the fungus is getting? Does it have enough nutrients? If not, it'll pause. And then you give it nutrients, it's off to the races. You can completely yeah. dehydrate them. It sounds like unlimited potential for yes, usage. It's, it's unlimited genetic potential, right? Yeah. And that's why, and that's why they're so integral to organic life. Um, a good fact is like um, uh, fungi, uh, so back, let's go back to when uh, the plants branched off, right? So plants branched off of kingdom fungi and went off and started doing their own crazy thing, right? And so all of a sudden plants develop lignin, right? This completely chaotic, crazy cell that no one understood, like no one's ever seen this evolutionary trait before. All of a sudden for like a hundred million years, fungi couldn't eat plant life. And they all shut down. That's where we got all of our oil and coal. That was the Carboniferous period. The Carboniferous period was the only period in the history of the earth where fungi en masse forgot how to eat a majority of carbon of uh, carbon life. Like right, back, life. Back, back up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what happened and why? So in the Carboniferous period, which is plants, what? Like a geological uh, so, epoch or yeah, what? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. It's a geological epoch. Um, back before the dinosaurs and everything okay. um, or around the time of the dinosaurs too um, because they all overlap. The Carboniferous period is when all of a sudden we see this buildup in, um, in the layers of the earth of coal and oil. What coal and oil are are Important. just hydrocarbon. Yeah, they're carbon, right? Mm -hmm. All they are are hyper-compressed. If you took a tree and just compressed it over hundreds of millions of years, mm -hmm. you would get coal yep. or oil or natural gas, right? You would get our fossil fuels. And what's interesting is you, if you wanted to grow mushrooms on coal or mm -hmm. oil, you can. Of course, because they eat because it's uh, they carbon. eat the stuff. Yeah, yeah, they eat carbon. And so the Carboniferous period is this period in the history of the Earth where fungi, right? the primary decomposers of organic life mm -hmm. could not decompose that life because all of a sudden plants started growing lignin, right? These completely chaotic cells that they had never, ever seen before, right? So plants they, all of a sudden, they adapted evolutionary. over millions yep. of years to this new lignin thing. 
Yep. How did, how was lignin formed originally? So it was an. It's, I actually don't know uh, the evolution. Was it created record. so the plants could not be could live longer and not be decomposed? Is it, no, no. It's not live longer and be decomposed. Uh, if you go back to like Darwinian evolution, the reason why plants started growing lignin um, more than likely is because they had to get tall to get their resources right. So if you think about like CO two levels, CO two is heavier than oxygen, and way way back you know, millennial, like way, 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 way back, our CO2 levels were much, much higher. And so plants had to start getting taller and taller and taller, right? And you can't do that with normal cells, like a fungi and humans, like we all have size limitations, like mammals, like we have supersized mammals, but even then there are limitations. Mm -hmm. These trees want to stand up like four or five stories, right? And they're not, they're about as big as round as your arm. And so what ended up happening is they developed this evolutionary adaptation to allow them to get strong and tall, right? Without having to increase your mass that much. Um, and so lignin, the super chaotic organic cell was just this evolutionary adaptation of plants mm -hmm. to fulfill their evolutionary need. Unfortunately, they weren't talking to everyone else. It's kind of like a game of telephone, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're branched off, Fungi are now off like in their other timeline, like doing their own thing. All of a sudden plants start developing this and fungi look at this new cell shape and they're like, I don't know, are you guys, anybody else seen this? So yeah, it's, it's amazing. Fun, they forgot how to consume. They basically had to learn how to eat this new cell. And it took and millions of years to do that. It took millions of years. And the fungi and we have now have learned and can pretty much consume like anything. Yep. And this is why we will never, ever have another period where we could actually generate fossil fuels. Right. You would because, because of why? Because remember, fungi, ex um, fungi exist in all organic matter. So um, rocks, fungi are in their cells. Um, they're in our cells. They're in hair cells. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Ro rocks are organic not, matter. Not, uh, yeah, rocks are organic. Uh, well, yes. Doesn't organic mean no? Doesn't it mean like alive? No. No, organic doesn't mean alive. Organic means basically carbon based. Okay, sure. Right. It's it, it's kind of like it. We again, we've had to redefine a lot of things, and so um, it's it's more. Um, chemistry and things like that. But that's one of the reasons why fungi could demolish rock. Like at mm -hmm. first, like that was the only thing around. So they learned how to decay that first. That's amazing. Um, and that's why lichen is so critical. Like if you go up to the mountains or forest and you see those rocks covered in lichen, those lichen are literally generating the soil under your feet. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Carboniferous period is this period in time where fungi just couldn't eat this massive amount of organic life and it just built up and it made coal and oil and everything else. And that's why we will never be able to make it again, because a good example of this is the Minuteman missile. The min there's um, a nuclear missile here in the U S if you're overseas, it's called the Minuteman nuclear missile. These are stored in large vertical silos. You've probably seen on TV or in the media um, missile silos. Um, if you were to enter one of these missile silos, as far as I understand, and it's to this day, it's still true. Um, hypersonic missiles, such as the Minuteman, actually have to have uh, what's termed a ablative layer of armor, right? And what that means is when you're traveling at hypersonic speed, you vibrate a lot, right? And so if you just make everything out of steel, it'll fall apart. So the Minuteman nuclear missile actually has a layer of core. Right, it's this layer of organic cork that has to sit in between all these layers of steel to keep them from falling apart. Here's the problem. <laughs> you obviously don't want your nuclear missiles to decay. The problem is that if you were to go and take a piece of cardboard from the store or cork from the store, it's already got fungi in itself, mm -hmm. right? It's they're everywhere. Fungi. They're everywhere, they're in my hair, they're in my skin, they're in my belly button, right? Um, and it's what they have to do is they spray the Minuteman missile like multiple times per day with a fungicide so powerful that if a human being were to touch it or inhale it, they would die. 
like within, I think it's minutes or mm-hmm. less, right? It's a fungicide that powerful. And it's because fungi figured out everything. Like they're like organic life on earth. We got you covered. Like we can decay anything. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we would actually have to create an environment that was completely free of fungi to basically recreate the environment where you could create oil and gas. Wow. Well, that that's a whole lot of information. It's really, uh, really, (laughs) really cool to let, but it's amazing. It's it's like, that's, I hope people realize like how, how amazing that is. And I think it's a great transition into talking about how you think we can use like engineering of what are you, are you creating new fungi to decompose things that already exist or like, what, what is your view on using fungi to let's, let's start looking at this through the, the lens of like creating a more healthy environment, climate change, plastic decomposition. Let's talk about all that oh, yeah. stuff. Like, well, I mean, let's, let's start from like coil, like oil, shell, like coal. Mm-hmm. Like how can we use fungi to like yeah. fix the, that situation so, that we're dealing with? So if we go back to what I was saying, it's like fungi and their spores are these little bits of computer code, right? They're mm-hmm. hackable. You can do all sorts of crazy things. But what's cool is you don't really need to make new species, Right. Because the amazing and beautiful thing about fungi is that um, the amazing and beautiful thing about fungi is that you can sit there and be like, okay, I, you happen to know how to eat lignin, right? Now, lignin is where we get. Um, Sounds like it took, a, took some effort. It took some effort yeah. to get there. But lignin is what polymers are made out of. What are, are polymers? That's, that's gas. That's like polymers, oil. Polymers are plastic. Yeah. Okay. And hydrocarbons, right? So if you think about um, oil, gas, natural gas, et cetera, or not natural gas, but oil and coal is pure compressed carbon, yep. right? And so when you light it on fire, that's actually a, a chemical reaction that is oxidizing that carbon. Um, and so you can think about fungi is doing roughly the same thing. Like they attack that carbon and they just release the elements they don't need to consume the rest. Well, way, 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 way back, a fungus, a white rot fungi, probably like an oyster mushroom, sat there and figured out how to eat lignin. Well, then it bumped into some coal and other new molecule shapes like hydrocarbons and other things. And it said, wait a minute, that looks just like the lignin molecule I just ate. So I'm going to spend a hot second adapting my enzyme profile to unlock the nutrients I know are in that molecule. And in this case, nutrients is just pure base elements for the mushrooms. Yeah, it's like, it's like give me sugar or give me a cellulose molecule that I will break down into sugars, mm-hmm. right? It's like <laughs> men in black, sugar and water, right? It's... Yeah. Uh, it's there are just looking for molecules. And so what I can do and what fungi like Paul Stamets and, and other researchers in the 60s, 70s and 80s figured this out, right? They said, wait a minute, if, if fungi already know how to eat all carbon and they eat coal and oil, that means that they can eat hydrocarbons. Mm-hmm. Let's do an experiment. So what they did in a couple of experiments experiments they took a great big pile of soil in a parking lot and they covered it in crude oil right just absolutely saturated the damn thing then they took a bunch of pearl oyster mushroom spawn and mixed it into that great big pile season goes by well actually months (laughs) go by and all of a sudden they start seeing organic life appear grasses birds bugs worms etc things that should not be able to exist in a pile of oil soaked dirt. And the reason why is that a fungus through this stomach that they use actually act like the world's best filter because Mm -hmm. they are actually, they say, give me your molecules. I don't care that you're oil. I want you to dissipate into your base molecular form so I can absorb you. And then when it fruits, when that mushroom fruits, there's nothing passed to the fruit body except for heavy metals. Like that's the one thing that uh, a mushroom, 
uh, fungus growing in an oil pile, like that mushroom will have heavy metals in it. Um, but otherwise they remove everything else toxic. And so what happened in these early experiments that shocked everyone is that they started spiking this pearl oyster mushroom spawn and within a season, right? They had perfectly viable hummus or humus for the garden. What does that mean? And uh, basically it was perfectly good, rich soil that you could grow food crops on. Mm -hmm. It was completely clean. And fast forward decades, they are now using fungi in cleaning up oil spills. The Exxon Valdez spill was I was one of about the first to bring ones. that up. Yeah. Yep. The Exxon Valdez spill, actually, I was in Alaska. Uh, I was a kid uh, back when Exxon Valdez happened. And I remember they were using these crazy booms and sponges and everything. All of a sudden, they start using these booms filled with fungi and they start spreading mushroom spawn and everything on beaches and stuff like that. Uh, Deepwater Horizon was another one where they started deploying uh, spray fungal agents, right? Because what they realized is that these guys will literally just consume the oil. And once they're out of oil, they just either die off or they start eating the things that they're supposed to eat. In other words, if I were to take, if I were to take a room and I were to put um, a pile of oil-soaked soil and let the fungus do its job, then once it's out of oil, it'll go inert, right? It'll just kind of stop because there's no fuel source. Mm -hmm. If I were then mix in wood, right? It would just eat that wood and basically go back to the molecular profile that it I had before. Mm -hmm. So it basically what you end up with is a mushroom that says, oh, I'm out of oil. I'm just going to go eat everything else I've eaten. Um, and so it just dissipates into the environment. And so... Fast forward to starting this company, um, I had an accident, right? A happy accident. We had pearl oyster, Pluterus ostriatus. Um, I made a bunch of auger plates, which is just basically uh, plastic dishes of nutrients that we grow fungi on. Um, and I put them in a Ziploc bag and thrown them in the refrigerator. The refrigerator is 35 degrees Fahrenheit and dark. I got busy and I ignored it for a couple of months. We went back and opened it up and the pearl oyster lacking all other nutritional sources had started eating the plastic. It mm -hmm. had actually broken out of the shrink wrap that we had encased all the plates in. And it actually started eating the Petri dishes and the shrink wrap and actually had conformed into a single fungus. Like it had actually knitted all 20 auger plates together into one mass. And so that was sort of an aha moment, right? I was like, wait, wait, wait. wait. So, so a fungus is like a network and a mushroom is just kind of like, like an email kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's more like your hand, right? It, it's, it's more like if the fungus is your body, like uh, a mushroom is your finger or okay. a disposable appendage that imagine if your fingers, like every time you use the finger, you could just grow a new one, or right? Like semen. Exactly. Like it's their sex organ. Like it's yeah. a replaceable sex organ. So this um, mushroom in the bag. All right. You were going to say something. This mushroom no, no, in the bag. Ahead. So this mushroom that you put in the bag, um, it started eating the plastic bag and turn. Yep. It was, it turned something that's we consider waste into living biomaterial. It, it turned it into food, right? So the way that this works is come to find out if you starve a fungus, a fungus gets angry. And so the fungus will sit there and it basically think about it like spinning, um, spinning a lock in a safe, right? Because uh, a lock in a safe, you just have these big plates that have notches in them. And all you have to do is line up the notches. Um, and so what a fungus does is it's like, wait a minute, I smell nitrogen, right? I smell carbon. And so what it does is it starts spinning this enzyme profile. It starts excreting these enzymes and if those enzymes don't work, if they don't release all of the nutrition that the fungus wants, it starts emitting new enzymes, right? It adapts, right? So when we starve the pearl oyster in the, in the refrigerator, those nutrient plates have a mixture of what's called auger and auger, auger powder and malt extract. Uh, what that basically is, is like sugar in um, seaweed jelly, right? So all it is, is just, it's, it's like drinking a Red Bull for the mushroom, 
So the mushroom, once it ate all of that in the dark, it was like, I'm pissed off. I'm really hungry. But I smell, I smell something. So it just started emitting more and more and more enzymes and it broke free. It got access to more oxygen, more moisture. And it said, okay, I have all the time in the world. And it sat there until it had unlocked the enzyme profile for the shape of the molecule it needed. Mm-hmm. And then it just started eating. Right. So- it's like, that's what they do. That's their only job is to sit there and figure out how to decompose what they're sitting on. So this was after how long after you had started the, the business did this happen? Uh, seven months. Okay. And then, so what was like your conclusion, like your takeaway from this, like watching this mushroom decompose like a plastic bag? So what I did is I said, okay, this stands to reason because if polymers and plastics, plastics are polymers and even silica is a form of polymer with the organics removed, right? Um, What that means is if you can trick, so this actually redefined my business, right? This is why all of our, all of our, all of our dirt and all of our substrates, it's like, I play biotech, right? It's, we are measuring things out by the gram. We do like everything is sterilized, et cetera. And it's because it's like, I figured out that if I have a dung loving mushroom, what it wants is nitrogen, right? So if, if a mushroom says, I want to eat poop, I'm like, okay, what's in poop? It's hemicellulose, cellulose, you know, things we can't digest or cows can't digest, bacteria and sugars, right? And basically nitrogen. So what that means is if I replace the poop with spent coffee grounds, which are basically pure partially composted nitrogen, that fungus will, should, in theory, eat that, right? Yes. So what we did is we, it's like what that unlocked for all of us is the ability to say, okay, if I want a mushroom, if I want to grow a mushroom or train it to eat a plastic, all I have to do is put it in an enclosed environment and give it enough time and a good enough sterile environment to allow it to adapt. Once that mushroom adapts to eating that plastic or that new food source, I clone it because that clone or the spores from that mushroom already has the knowledge. Yep. Bingo. So what I get to do, what we've been doing with all of our genetics is training them, right? So I can train a dung loving species to eat spent coffee grounds. I can train an oyster mushroom that normally eats uh, just trees. My first oyster mushroom grows were on dung-based substrate. And most people look at me like, what? They don't eat poop. And I'm like, yeah, they do. Like, I got lucky. Yeah, I admit that. Like, it was kind of like beginner's luck. But yeah, it's like, it it took a little while, but it just, I grew 70 pounds of oyster mushrooms on poop. It tastes great. Um, And so what that, that moment, like pulling those out was this moment where we realized that science was the path forward like we have like these aren't mystical un like ununderstandable things right they are observable they are little biochemistry engines right their job is to decompose organic matter what i can do as a scientist is i can say like okay first mr mushroom i'm going to train you on a ziploc bag After you figure out how to eat that Ziploc bag, I'm going to clone you or take your spores. I'm going to grow them out again. Then I'm going to feed you. um, A Gatorade bottle? A Gatorade bottle. Yeah, a good example. And then I clone that. And over time, what happens is that the fungus that I'm cloning and building up gets a bigger archive of molecule shapes. And this is the crazy, this is the mind blowing thing. The more you do this, the more effective they get, right? They don't really forget this stuff, right? And so as long as you keep changing their nutrient source, they're always excited, right? They're like, hey, this is kind of cool. I want to unlock that carbon. Mm -hmm. Um, And so as we train it, my goal is to be able to hit, like once we get the core of our business revenue, like fresh mushrooms, dried mushrooms, all the stuff that we're doing, 
then we're going to open up, then we're going to open the floodgates on the R and D. And what we've been doing is slowly training these fungi in the lab piece by piece, time over time to start eating bits and pieces of more complex things. Like we're going to make later on, we'll make auger dishes that actually have crude oil in them. Right. And we'll be able to start it even earlier. Like this is obviously things a year from now. Sure. Um, but really all we need to do is start now with just a couple of bags and jars and start taking a mushroom that you can find in the forest, right? You can go and find plastic eating mushrooms in the forest by your house. Like go and find an oyster mushroom. Trust me, it's not going to work the first time or the second time or the 30th time, but sooner or later it'll, it'll figure it out. Right. Um, And that has made us like our substrates, our grains, everything, how we grow has just gotten so much better, so much easier, right? Amazing. We can we can control like CO2 levels. We kind of know like we've gotten a lot more efficient and it's all about embracing the fact that fungi really want to grow. Like they really want to do their job and they're mm-hmm. really incentivized to do it. And most of the time when they don't want to grow, it's something I did wrong. Sure. Right. 99.99% of the time, it's something I did. So I, I'm, I'm really amazed by this concept. And that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to talk to you. Just the idea of having like a bucket of plastic and then throwing like a spore in there and having it decompose all the plastic I thought was amazing. So I ran this idea by my friend. I told him I was going to be interviewing you. Who's like really into like permaculture and like environment yep. and stuff. And he was like, that's crazy, man, because we, it might like remove the efficiency of plastic altogether because the the mushrooms like these spores these fungi my bad it's fungi not mushrooms mm-hmm. um can s- spread across the whole world and they're all this interconnected network so then uh, you know it could start eating your plastic while you're still using it i just wanted to ask you about that and see well, what you so, think and, and that's an interesting thing so that's yes we're very aware of the danger so that's scary right? yeah <laughs> But here's what's cool is I can make mushrooms that don't spore, right? So okay. as a commercial grower, as a commercial grower, mushroom spores are a pain in my ass. Mushroom spores are messy. They're muddy. They clog everything up. When you breathe them in, you, you feel gross, nasty, right? And so we figured out as a community a long time ago how to basically breed out the sporulation properties of that mushroom. So it's like long term, I think the safest bet would actually be to create a mushroom that either doesn't spore or propagate itself. Um, but here's what I'm thinking, and I need to test this, and I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but I but here's my dream, right? Here's the moonshot that in my heart, like I have a notebook at home that I've been filling this out for months now. I want to create um a version of ideally a white rock fungi that's trained on a broad range of polymers. I also want to experiment so you can actually reintroduce uh, organic molecules into silica, uh, silica, right? Uh, you can, uh, it's ultrasonic vibration. You basically, you, you take a motherboard from a computer and you shake it really fast and you spray water on it, right? And oxygen. Right. And all of a sudden it reintroduces those organic molecules. Right. So my dream is to work forward and just train these fungi and really understand like the limitations of this molecular matching stomach. Um, And then I want to see if so fungi won't take hold unless things aren't moving. So in other words, if you had a pile of plastic sitting in a yard, yes if this thing landed on it, in theory, it would opportunistically eat that. Mm -hmm. However, the plastic of your car is moving. There's friction. Things like there's not a sometimes sometimes it's moving. And so there's there's an interesting like I. Yes, there are risks and I'm very observant of the risks because God knows like we have done horrible things as human beings. Um, And I want to see like microplastics, 
right? Let's talk about the one thing that is on everyone's mind. If I were to create a species like this and release it, there's a very high likelihood that anywhere where microplastics have cooled in our environment, in our waterways or on beaches and things like that, goes away, right? It just, like those spores spread. Huge and potential they, win. And then they fade into the background. But as you said, right, here's the problem. Like you're creating a super fungi that can basically eat things that we kind of assume they couldn't easily. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so that's a risk. And so I think mitigating that is going to be, it's actually, it's actually a relatively easy thing, but also I think given the amount of plastic in the world and given the amount of fungi in the world, we already see fungi and bacteria eating plastic in the wild already. Right. And there's a reason why they don't really attack the things we touch every day. Right. Because they're not really sitting still. They're not really, um, you know, think about, you know, the plastic cards in your wallet or all the plastic at your house. Like it's not really sitting still until you're like, and I mean, for months. Right. Mm -hmm. We're talking on a timeline where these spores have to land. And then they have to have these good, these perfect conditions of air, water, moisture, and food over weeks and months sometimes, because if it's, if it's rubber or if it's something it's never eaten before, it's going to take a long time to germinate. Um, and so it's, it's going to require a lot of studying, but I think, I think fungi will ultimately have the answer. Right. I think, um, it's sort of the fungal playground and we're just playing in it. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely, I hear that concern and I do yeah. worry about that because we have, like I said, scientists don't have the best track record of thinking about the consequences of their actions. And sure. I started this company, not just because of mushrooms, but because I mean, my soul hurt. Like I had been chasing nothing but a paycheck, not a dream, just a paycheck just you know other people's dreams and startup ideas for my entire life and fundamentally i think that tech went wrong without embracing ethics like full-throatedly right and now we have companies like facebook and google and others where i'm not going to call them evil but mm -hmm. i'm going to say that they're extremely lacking in ethics right in common sense like ai isn't a good thing because AI, artificial intelligence, is actually pretty dumb, right? And it's dangerous because it's so dumb. Um, it's not smart at all. And that's the great lie. And from an ethical standpoint, I found myself at age 39, 40, looking around and realizing that my entire generation had gone to work for places that are just basically building better weapons for other capitalists. And intellectual property, patents and copyrights, like, are just, I mean, it's a nightmare in tech. And then there's the misogyny and everything else. And I was like, no, right? Fungi offer us an opportunity to kind of, for me at least, to say, okay, enough is enough, right? I'm going to go and I want to build a business that is ethical and that we talk about the things that make us uncomfortable. We talk about money issues. We talk about releasing things into the environment by accident. Um, we talk about, you know, mistakes that we've made. Um, but more importantly, we also lead as a business with ethics, right? It's like we, instead of having the Google model of do no evil, it's like, we will, we're not going to have a motto. We're just simply not going to do that, right? It's like, we are going to sit down and we are going to question everything and we're going to test everything. And we're going to publish everything, even if we don't agree with the tests, right? We have a, we have a society now where like 80% plus of scientists cannot recreate the results in the scientific papers they read. Wow. And so I want to run this place. I am running this place with what I hope is a soul and a soul that is meant to be mindful of the things that we have done as humanity in the past and learning from that.
right? Releasing things in the environment, making super bugs or super bacteria. You know, we now have the capability of with CRISPR and everything else, you can now recreate some of the most virulent strains of the flu in your house, mm-hmm. right? I can take the E. coli back. Uh, uh, I can take E. coli and I can say, I can take a red reishi mushroom and I can figure out the beneficial compound and the genetic marker that that red reishi is using to create that compound. I can inject and sideload it into E. coli and the E. coli being like this little bacteria that's only there to spread itself or virus. Uh, I can't remember which it is now. Um, Worse. But uh, it's only job is to replicate and breed. And so all of a sudden, when you inject it with that red reishi genetic, all it does is instead of spitting out more E. coli, it starts spitting out the red reishi molecule, right? So we already know how to create things like synthetic. Um, a lot of therapists working with psilocybin research are actually using synthetic psilocybin that's actually mm-hmm. generated in a bioreactor. It's not actually grown from mushrooms. Crazy. And so I want, it's like, we're talking about climate change. And I think we're talking about a lot of stuff, but it's like, but the podcast and everything else, it's like, we have a problem on our hands and it's this existential crisis. And I never wanted to start a business to make the problem worse. Uh-huh. Right. And it's not to say that we won't make mistakes, but if, if, if people are listening to this and wondering if they can get to the world of mushrooms and do things the right way, you can. And part of it is like, you literally have something sitting in your hands, like, from a single one cell by one cell sam- or one centimeter by one centimeter sample, I can grow enough food for a city, right? Using waste. Like all of our stuff is grown on waste products, sawdust and soy holes and freaking spent coffee grounds, right? It's amazing. Um, and so. But before I'm, you do that, you're going to donate ten percent. You're going to donate ten percent of your revenue and all your unsold mushrooms to food banks in the meantime. Before you can feed the whole city, basically, yeah, yeah, that's um, it's amazing, man. There's there's so much potential in there, and I just really appreciate you coming on and just sharing it all. And it's just it's too much to think about. Um, it's a I lot. Just, it's it's a lot. But what's we got to take solace in the fact that it's like, as, as the picture got clearer for me, the more I realized how connected we all are. Sure. Right. And it's like, what's, what's great is like each person I talk to, like you and the listeners, you know, the people I have working for me, it's like each person that we kind of pull into this web, it really is this web of exploration and like kind of realizing it's like, all of a sudden you see this thing that's so powerful that's everywhere. And you're like, Oh my God, like, why didn't anyone tell me about this before? Like, this is cool. It's so cool. We're like, isol- like we're like the little mycelium. Like we all have our own different ideas and we can all connect our minds together and, and kind of accomplish anything that that's the way I see it. So, and so uh, a fungus, like a spore, that white mass is made up of hyper. Right. So a hyphae is a one cell by one cell thread. Right. So that thread is one cell by one cell. And so a mushroom is actually a woven, uh, a woven entity of these one cell by one cell bits of hypha. Right. Mm-hmm. At each tip of every hypha, they have something called the Spitzen corporate which is German for pointed growth. So I think it's a troll. If I'm being honest, I think the Germans <laughs> are playing a joke on us. But As always. It's in corporate. At the very tip of every hyphae. So think, a mushroom or a fungus has hundreds of millions of these hypha. At the tip of every one is a brain called the Spitzen corporate. Wow. The SPK. That SPK controls the growth of that hyphae. So yes, in a lot of terms, like human beings and our interconnectedness, and the interconnectedness of the forest is very akin to this, this mass of hype woven together and coordinating, right? And passing information to all kind of reach this shared common goal. And, you know, if you, if you lay that idea over things like climate change, it's like, okay, 
rather than trying to do a superhuman effort to kind of like get rid of everything all at once, what if we take the route of the hyphae and the mycelium, right? Where it's like you start interlinking each one of us together more and more and you weave that together into this branch. That branch of mycelium gets stronger and it's not one big thing though. It's all of us independently doing smaller things that accumulate to this larger thing. And if we attack climate change like that, it becomes more palatable. It becomes more understandable to people like what they can do, right? Like tiny things. Like if you have a yard, just come and get some of our spent mushroom blocks for free and spread them in your garden. Because guess what? You're sequestering carbon, right? It's like if each one of us is a hyphae and we read together into this mycelial web and we get stronger together, we can tackle these existential problems, right? And so it's like all of these analogies and metaphors really work because if you, if you go back, it's you lay that network on top of, if you lay the forest network on top of a computer network, on top of a, a neural network, mm-hmm. each one of them all looks the same. Because we all realized a long time ago, like back in the days of like Isaac Newton and the rest, we figured out that networks are more powerful because they're a network. And mm-hmm. that's because we're a people, right? And we have these pairs, these friends and bacteria and fungi and plants that once we pair with them, it's like, that's our superpower, right? That's like, that's our manifest destiny to like uh, our planet and stars, right? It's like, that's, that's it. And we can do that. And it's just a million grains of sand poured over a mountain will dissolve that mountain. Right? Just that's what we have to do. Right? We 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 can do this, but we've got to bind together. And that's that's a dream for this company. Bro. I mean, I've loved this whole podcast, but that last 15 minutes has been awesome i'm just so grateful that you came on and took the time to just share everything going on in your mind it really it means the world to me and i just i think you're really fucking cool um so so my my last question for you is like what advice would you give to yourself from 20 years ago knowing what you know now of course I feel like you took the right path, man. I know it sounds like it was kind of brutal, but it's like you're you in know, the spot we need you. Yeah, it's like 21. That's the, that's a hard part. Now it's like with all the self work and everything else that I've done, it's like I it's like I don't like the retread. But I think what I would tell my younger self, especially 20 years ago, being in a tech startup, you know, working 17 hours a day and not sleeping and sucking down enough caffeine to kill a bull. I would tell myself to go outside and lay down on the grass. I would tell myself to go out and uh, weird fact, like I went camping like a month ago and it's the first time I had been camping since I was 15. Wow. And it, it like, it was, it was significant. Like I cried a lot. Like I didn't, hell yeah. it was, it was a part of me I had lost. And so if I had to go back and give advice to myself or really anyone listening to this, it's go out and you don't have to find a big thick forest. Take your phone, turn your phone off. Just take your music off, take your headphones off and just walk around the forest, smell it, touch it. And what you'll realize is like, we lose a lot in our day-to-day lives. And my advice to myself would be go and reclaim that, right? Go, just go back and reclaim the thing that made us as humans really evolve and shine. And that's nature, right? That's our, that's the natural order we exist in. And just going back out to that, not not believing that tech or machine learning or some other made up solution to a made up problem is going to fix the world. Um, I personally have always just wanted to help people. Right. And this, is this and fungi are the best way to do that. Right? It's, that's just the way it goes. 
And so going back 20 years, it would just be that. It would be, look, go back to me. Like, go back, like, stop listening to your ex-wife who didn't want to go camping, you know, just, you know, go out and I hate to say it, hug a tree, but hug a tree, right? It, it's, it's like, go out there and just touch that damn thing because it's like, touch it, dig down to its roots, right? And like, go out to your garden, right? Just go out to like that strip in the front of your house where you've got some rose bushes and some mulch. Dig under that mulch, like a couple of inches, and you'll see these white, huge ropes. That's a fungus. Those are its rhizomorphs, its ropes. Like, you'll dig down into that. And that advice to me is to not lose that magic, not that science. Right? And you see that in kids as they're growing up, and we quash it. Right? We tell them to go get that corporate job, that nine to five, and start providing and we take away the fact that they're sitting there asking the questions that we should have been asking all along, which was, what's dirt made out of? Right? Sometimes the most innocent question can have the most meaningful answer. And yeah, go back and tell the kid, you know, go outside and play in the dirt, son. We're going to put an end to that nine to five shit, man. This is not, this thing's, this is not going to keep going forward. Um, it's just, no. I don't know. The imagery really resonates with me. I hope it's resonating with all y'all. Jesse, dude, thanks for coming on, man. It's been a real no, honor thank to have you. Anytime. Anytime. Word up. All right, everybody. And we will, of course, see you next week for another episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. And have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Changing the Climate, the official podcast of Climate Change Realty. If you are very passionate about these issues and you know anyone considering buying or selling a home anywhere in the USA, then please visit ccrboulder.com today.